everyone. It's uh, nice to see you today. Again, we're in the heart of holiday season. Uh, maybe you're back from holiday and hope you had a good time, but I know there's quite a few away this week. But even in spite of that, it's lovely to have some visitors with us this morning. We know we've someone from down south, and we've even visitors from Australia as well. So uh, great to see you. Sorry, we, we couldn't bring you good weather today, summer weather. It was nice last Sunday, but this Sunday's a world of difference. Uh, and it actually is quite uh, significant in the sense of what passage we're going we're to be looking at today uh, in our th- story of Elijah. But before we get there, let me read uh, a few words from Psalm 150 to you. Uh, the psalmist says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our God is worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. We're going to see that today as we come to our passage later on. But let's bring him praise collectively together as we stand and sing our opening piece. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul prays him for 
Please take a seat. Let me also welcome those uh, who are watching online. Uh, you're never forgotten, and uh, we, we trust that you're, you're, you're blessed as you meet with us. Just a few announcements at this stage before we pray and then sing again. Um, just to make you aware that, as you'll see up on screen, from Monday to Friday this week is the, the REACH uh, summer camp through Coaching for Christ, uh, which is being held in Cookstown High School, uh, and that's from 6 to 8 o'clock. So it's basically a few of the, the evangelical churches in the town have come together. Uh, they, they come together to run events such as this uh, through the banner REACH. Uh, and uh, you'll maybe hear a little bit more about that next Sunday morning. Uh, but this week, they're having that camp uh, for uh, young people, uh, using the means of soccer to, or football, that's very American, uh, football to um, uh, reach people with the gospel. So do pray. If you're not helping out this week, thank you to, to those who are helping out, but if you're not helping out, do pray uh, each evening, Monday to Friday from 6 to 8 o'clock, that God would reach uh, people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then on Tuesday night, uh, our summer midweeks are continuing, where, where some of the men in the church are, are, are taking the responsibility for doing the first uh, eight psalms. We've had the first two psalms so far, so this Tuesday night, James uh, is going to be speaking on Psalm 3. Um, so I encourage you to come along to support James, to pray, uh, and to, to hear from God as he speaks to us. Even if you're helping out at reach, you know it finishes at 8 o'clock, bomb up the road uh, and uh, get in for 5, 10 past 8. We'd love to see you there, uh, and we can pray specifically for reach as well. Then on, on Wednesday night, it's not up on the screen there, but on Wednesday night, there's going to be a, a prep night uh, for our own Holiday Bible Club. So that's going to be at half seven um, here in the hall, I'm assuming, yeah. Uh, so bring scissors, and here's a strange one, bring plenty of toilet roll tubes. So hopefully you've been gathering those up. Uh, if not, do so, uh, and bring them along on, on Wednesday night. Um, it's just an opportunity to do some, some prep, cutting, sticking, uh, I imagine there'll be painting, something like that as well. Uh, so again, come along at half seven. And again, if you're helping out at Reach and you want to help out um, at that prep night, just come along once you're done uh, at, at the Reach event. So that's half seven. Then uh, next Saturday, we had to postpone our, our church barbecue uh, yesterday just with the, the weather forecast being thundery showers. So that's now next uh, Saturday, as you'll see. Uh, hopefully the weather will stay dry, uh, four o'clock in Drum Manor. Uh, and again, as you can see, the outreach prayer meeting is in the morning uh, at half seven. So again, encourage you to come along to that. And then just to make you aware that next Sunday is the last day that you, you're able, if you're wanting to contribute towards the cost of Holiday Bible Club, next Sunday's the last uh, day you can do that. And again, the blue bucket there is at the back at the, on the tack table. Okay? So again, these are the announcements. Um, remember them uh, in your prayers and, and seek to, to get engaged uh, where you can. But let me pray and then we'll sing again. Father, thank you that we can come here this morning as people from different backgrounds, different upbringings, even different cultures, and we can come here together as one people to worship the Lord God Almighty. Thank you that we can call you our God through Jesus Christ because you have reached down into the darkness of our sin and iniquity and you have saved us by grace through the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, on the cross of Calvary. And Father, we want to praise you and thank you for everything you mean to us, for everything you are, and for everything you've brought us, because you are worthy. And we recognize this morning that without you, we would be nowhere. Without you, we would be nothing. And without you, Lord, we, we would simply be lost forevermore. And yet we thank you, Father, that in Christ this morning, we can say with assurance that we are forgiven, that there is no condemnation for us, and that our future is secure in him, that we have a home in heaven waiting for us, secure by the power and majesty of our God. But Lord, we also thank you 
that we can say with confidence today that we serve a powerful God. We're going to see that this morning as we come to the Scriptures later on, as we see your power in sending fire from heaven. And Lord, help that, uh, this, the story, the, the account of Elijah as we think about it today, help that to fill our hearts with courage, with boldness, and with confidence, even as we pray for the, the week of events that are coming up uh, this week. And the knowledge, Lord, that the God who sent fire from heaven is also the God who can move in power in our midst today. We pray for this service that we might see you in all your glory and majesty, that we wouldn't see anyone else, but that we would just be captivated by the glory of our God. Lord, as we think of Reach this week, the Coaching for Christ event, we pray that you would come in great power and save many boys and girls from their sins. But not only boys and girls, but also their parents, their grandparents. May we see, even as we meet together next week, Lord, how you have worked, how you have moved, how you have transformed lives by your grace. Lord, we pray for the shelter this week. We pray for James on Tuesday night. We pray for the Holy Bible Club prep. We pray for everything that will happen this week. May you be right at the center of it all, and may you move in power to build up believers and to challenge the lost, we pray. So, Lord, as we continue now in worship and praise, help us to come with clean hands and a pure heart, Help us to come in reverence and yet with joy and thanksgiving because you are not only our God today, but you are also our Father. And for that, we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing again of the greatness of God now, the splendor of the King clothed in majesty. How great is our God? Let's stand and sing, please. <clears throat>
actually want to uh, read from the Scriptures now. We've quite a, a lengthy reading uh, in 1 Kings today. Uh, we're, we're looking at this summer series, The Days of Elijah, and we're in chapter 18 today, a famous chapter. I'm sure we, we all know it very well. We're not going to be dealing with the whole chapter today. We are going to be dealing with the vast majority of it. Um, we're going to be looking at the first 40 verses and then next week, God willing, uh, I'll take us through the, the remaining verses of the chapter. So let's read God's word. First Kings 18, reading from verse 1. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, go, tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go, tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, behold whom I, before whom I'm, I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who ate at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire on it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, 
And they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, uh, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water. And pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then... The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. This is the word of the Lord. Let's sing just one more time before we look at this passage in more detail. We're going to ask God to speak to us. It's a familiar passage, uh, and we always need the help of the Spirit as we look at, at, at passages of Scripture. So let's pray that God would speak, that God would work, that God would impact and change us.
Father, we, we echo the words of that song that we've just sang together. Speak to us, we pray. Teach us, we ask. Renew us afresh, we plead. Lord, may you penetrate our hearts with your truth. By the power of the Spirit, we ask, so that we might see you in all your glory, all your majesty, all your beauty, and that we might bow the knee to you afresh today in worship, in praise, in allegiance, and in faith. For you, a lunar God, you have no rivals, you have no equals, no one compares to you. Help us to see that today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you could really uh, be accused of uh, living under a rock if you haven't heard uh, or seen reports of the trial this year between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. It's been everywhere, honestly. If you have missed it, I don't know where you've been living. But this famous couple uh, were married back in 2015, and only a year later, Heard filed for divorce and was granted a temporary restraining order after claiming that Johnny Depp had verbally and physically abused her. But in spite of these allegations, they eventually released a, a joint statement uh, saying that they had put their dispute to rest. And so for a period of time, it looked as if the relationship between this former couple was quite civil. But then in 2018, Heard wrote an article for the Washington Post describing her experience as a public figure representing domestic abuse. Now, she didn't mention her ex-husband by name, but Johnny Depp saw this as a personal attack that derailed his career and damaged his reputation. So, he sued his ex-wife for defamation while also claiming that she was not the victim of domestic violence, but actually the perpetrator. Well, the trial kicked off this year on the 11th of April. And over the course of the trial, the, me the media coverage was absolutely rampant. You couldn't go on social media, you couldn't pick up a newspaper, you couldn't turn on the, the television or watch the news without being confronted with reports of how this trial was progressing. And like any trial, there was a lot of back and forth. Depp accused Heard of being abusive, while Heard accused Depp of being the same. Likewise, Depp accused Heard of negatively impacting his reputation, while Heard claimed the same. And in a lot of ways, it could be described as the battle of the year, with everyone inevitably asking the question, who will win? Johnny Depp or Amber Heard? Well, eventually on the 1st of June, this year, the jury unanimously declared that Heard had defamed Depp, awarding him some spare change, $5 million in punitive damages and $10 million in compensatory uh, damages. But up until the verdict was announced, it was a compelling contest that captured everyone's attention. Everyone wanted to know who was going to win. Well, as we come here to 1 Kings, we're presented with an even more compelling battle. You see, even though Israel's history was rooted in the worship of Yahweh, King Ahab had imported widespread idolatry with the worship of Baal taking center stage in the life of Israel. And in light of this, God had disciplined his people, we've seen that already, by stopping the rain and subsequently bringing famine to the land. But now the time had come for God to confront this idolatry head on through a public contest for supremacy. And the words on everyone's lips were this, who will win? God or Baal? Who would emerge victorious and prove themselves to be the true and living God? Compelling, captivating. And that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. So firstly, let's think about the challenge in verses 1 to 20. For three years now, 
there had been no rain in the land. I know that's hard for us to imagine, but there was no rain for three years in the land. Therefore, when you think about it, this was a period of bad press for Baal. I mean, let's remember, he was supposed to be a fertility god. He was supposed to be someone who guaranteed rain in the land so that good crops would be produced. Yet for three years now, there'd been no rain. There'd been no crops. With this in mind, people were undoubtedly beginning to question Baal's ability to bless the land with fertility. But of course, this drought and famine had been sent by God as an act of discipline upon his idolatrous people and as a way of showing them that Baal, this fertility God, was false. In fact, this is confirmed for us in verse 1, as we read that after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Here we see that God was going to send the rain again. However, it was important that God didn't just do this unannounced. Because what would happen if he just sent the rain? Well, inevitably, the people of the land would have said, well, okay, Baal maybe didn't send rain for three years, but look, he's back again. He's sending the rain. And they would have turned back to him, worshipped him. And so God instructs Elijah here, to meet with Ahab in order to lay down a challenge. Now, while this was happening, we're told that the famine was severe in Samaria. Therefore, Ahab called Obadiah, who was basically in charge of the palace and the king's right-hand man, and instructed him to go throughout the land in search of grass. Now, that mightn't seem like a strange request at first, but it does become unusual when we're told why he wants to find grass. Did you notice? He's looking for grass in order to keep horses alive. Now, isn't that strange? As king, surely your first responsibility should be to keep your people alive. Yet here is Ahab focusing all his attention on starving animals instead of people. And so what's going on here? Well, very simply, this is an example of a king who's only interested in looking after himself. You see, in biblical times, horses and mules were essential for national security. Therefore, if Ahab lost these to famine, it would mean that the nation would be weakened and they'd ultimately become vulnerable to the attack of surrounding nations. And if another nation attacked Israel during this time of military weakness, who would be target number one? Well, of course, it would be the king, the leader, the ruler of the land. And so with this in mind, Ahab's actions display a clear, selfish concern for his own well-being. But as we're introduced to Ahab's plans to find grass, we're also told something really significant about Obadiah. We're told that he not only feared the Lord greatly, but he had also hidden a hundred prophets of the Lord in a cave, and he was feeding them with bread and water. Now, the reason he did this was because Jezebel, Ahab's wife, was ordering their execution. So when you think about it, Obadiah's actions were incredibly risky. For not only was he undermining the, the, the king's wife, but he was also putting his own welfare on the line. For if he was discovered, what would happen to him? He'd get his head chopped off probably. Yet to Obadiah, his allegiance to God was far more important than his allegiance to the king. Well, as we read on, we see that when Obadiah was searching for grass, he meets with Elijah who says, Go, tell your Lord, behold, Elijah's here. Now, Obadiah's response to Elijah's request is really revealing, for it shows us the condition of Ahab's heart. Did you notice that? See, God had stopped the rain. He had brought drought or famine to the land in order to discipline his people so that they would repent and turn back to him. But Obadiah shows us here that instead of softening Ahab's heart, the famine had actually hardened Ahab's heart. 
I mean, God's law clearly states, you shall have no other gods before me. As a Jew, Ahab would have known this. But the law also showed how God would bring blessing for obedience and curses for disobedience. He said these words, they're up on screen. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Alongside this, later on in that same passage, God said that he would strike them with drought and make the rain of their land powder. Again, Ahab would have known that. But instead of observing the drought and being led to repentance, Ahab's heart was hardened to the point that he had murderous intentions towards the spokesperson of God. For we're told in verse 10 that he had searched every nation, every kingdom looking for Elijah, even making them take an oath that if they were found to be lying, it would cost them their lives. And so this helps us to understand why Obadiah was so fearful of bringing this message to the king. You see, if Obadiah told the king that he had seen Elijah and Ahab then couldn't find him, what would happen to him? He'd be killed. <laughs> With this in mind, Elijah speaks to ease Obadiah's fears by assuring him in the name of the Lord that he would appear before Ahab. You see, while Obadiah, and this is greatly encouraging for us, while Obadiah greatly feared the Lord, he was still human. Therefore, there were inevitably moments when his heart was gripped by fear. I mean, who wouldn't be fearful of going to a king who had all the power and authority to put you to death and tell him, that Elijah was there, and yet he might not be there, and you would die. Who wouldn't be fearful of that? But even though he was fearful, notice he still walked in obedience. For we read in verse 16 that Obadiah told Ahab that he had seen Elijah. Well, after hearing this, Ahab eventually comes face to face with Elijah. And as we consider his words to Elijah, we should be shocked by his ignorance. Look at what he says. Is it you, you troubler of Israel? Isn't that amazing? The drought and the famine were the result of Ahab disobeying God's word by leading the nation into idolatry. His actions had brought the curse upon the land. Yet here we see him accusing Elijah of being the one who had brought the curse upon the land. What an idiot. Clearly God's discipline had been ignored by Ahab. For instead of coming before Elijah in recognition of his sin and repentance and seeking restoration with God, what's Ahab doing? Elijah, you're the problem and I need to kill you. How arrogant, how ignorant. And so instead of accepting the blame Notice Elijah is emboldened to point the finger of blame to where it truly lies. He says, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, let's not miss the, the, the boldness of Elijah's words here. Remember, he's standing before a king, someone who has the power to order his execution, yet Elijah doesn't hold back. He boldly declares, I'm not the problem, you are. You have sinned. You're the real troublemaker. You have brought the curse upon the land. Yet Elijah wasn't finished. For he goes on to say, Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Again, don't miss the significance of the boldness of Elijah's actions here. He's speaking to the king of Israel, the only one who has the authority to order people to do things. 
Yet here we see Elijah commanding the king to do something, to gather all Israel at Mount Carmel, along with 850 prophets, to challenge the claims of Baal. What would the king do? Would he allow Elijah to speak to him like that? Would he entertain this challenge? Or would he use his authority to stamp this bug out, get rid of him? Well, we'd almost expect the latter. Yet amazingly, we're told in verse 20, that Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Clearly, the challenge had been accepted and the contest was about to begin. But before we get there, Let's pause for a moment and apply some of this into our lives today. First point of application I want to make is how following God does not guarantee us a trouble-free life. It's amazing how many believers think that. Now, they might not verbalize it, but it's certainly seen in their reaction when hardship comes, for they often get angry at God. They blame Him for their struggle. But where did we ever get this idea that God will always shield us from harm? It's certainly not found in the Bible. For Jesus clearly said, in this world you will have trouble. And this account also emphasizes this. I mean, isn't it interesting that while God shielded Elijah from difficulty and famine at the brook and in the widow's care, he didn't shield Obadiah. For where's he? He's in the king's palace. Yeah, being fed probably. But he's serving leaders who were undermining God by executing his prophets. Yet in both scenarios, God was faithful. He shielded Elijah from difficulty, but he also kept Obadiah through difficulty. And the same will always be true in our lives as believers. Whether we find ourselves in a period of life that's trouble-free, or where we're burdened with difficulty, God will always be faithful. He will always give us the grace that we need in those moments. Therefore, in the good times and in the bad times, we can always rely on God. Yes, He never promises to shield us from difficulty, but He has promised to keep us through difficulty, and that should be more than enough for us. The second point of application I want to make is that even though God doesn't call everyone to public ministry, we can all be powerfully used by him. I mean, Obadiah here is working for the king, a man who had rejected God for the worship of Baal. And in view of this, there were undoubtedly times when Obadiah would have been tempted to compromise his faith, yet he remained faithful. This was displayed in how he hid the Lord's prophets when Jezebel was overseeing their execution. Now think about it, it would have been very tempting, very easy for Obadiah in that moment to go along with what was being done, to keep quiet and to do nothing. Yet Obadiah refused to compromise his faith. When push came to shove, he obeyed God rather than men, even though it could ultimately cost him his life. In doing this, Obadiah was powerfully used by God to protect these prophets. And that should be wonderfully encouraging to everyone here this morning who's a Christian. For what this teaches us is that even though we're not all called to public ministry, we can all be powerfully used by God in our everyday spheres of life. Therefore, in the workplace, in the university, school, community, family, friendship group, we can have a godly influence on other people due to our faithfulness to God. You see, like Obadiah, there's going to be many moments when we're tempted to compromise and go along with the crowd. Maybe doing something that we know is wrong in order to keep our friends, or performing an unethical task in work, because we're afraid of losing our jobs. But it's in these moments that our faithfulness to God will count. And when going against the flow can actually have a powerful impact on others for Christ. 
Third point of application is about the need to be bold in moments when God calls us to challenge others. I mean, here in this passage, Elijah is standing before the king. Imagine it. The very man who had the power to put him to death, yet he doesn't shrink away from his call to challenge Ahab. For in Elijah's mind, faithfulness to God was of paramount importance, even if it cost him his life. Well, likewise, we ought to be marked by faithfulness and boldness when it comes to standing for truth. Whether that's something public, like standing against abortion or same-sex marriage, or whether it's something private, like challenging a fellow believer about their sinful patterns. The key is always being faithful to God, always being bold to stand for truth, even if it costs us everything. And then the fourth point of application I want to make is the importance of walking in obedience to God's word. Ahab knew worshiping idols was forbidden. Yet he rejected God's word in order to do his own thing. Elijah, on the other hand, responded to God's word in obedience, even in those times when it could cost him dearly. Well, as Christians, we're called to do the same. You see, there's always going to be times in our lives when God's word calls us to make certain sacrifices or to give up certain things that we know are forbidden. Yet quite often what we're tempted to do is to turn our backs on God's word, to go our own way instead. But may this passage remind us that walking in disobedience to God's word will never lead to knowing his blessing in our lives. In fact, we shouldn't be surprised if we experience God's disciplining hand in these moments. And so instead of going our own way, we should always be striving to stand firm in the word of God. No matter what it costs us, no matter what sacrifice that entails, for nothing substitutes for God's blessing. The challenge. Secondly then, let's look at the contest in the remaining verses. As everyone gathered at Mount Carmel, Elijah came near to the people and said, how long, how long will you go on limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Now this was the crux of the context test. Elijah wanted to prove who the true and living God was so that the people of Israel would worship him alone. You see, this is the interesting thing. God's people hadn't completely abandoned him. Instead, they were hedging their bets by wavering between gods. They had a little bit of Baal, a little bit of Yahweh, a little bit of Asherah, and who knows who else. With this in mind, the rules of the contest were simple. Each side would take a bull, cut it into pieces, put it on the wood. Then they would call upon the name of their God and whoever answered by far would be proven to be the true and living God. But I wonder, did you notice in setting these rules, Elijah intentionally stacks the odds against him. Firstly, notice the contest takes place at Mount, Mount Carmel, the homeland of Baal worship. Secondly, Elijah was one man against 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. Thirdly, the prophets of Baal, they were allowed to go first. They were also given as much time as they wanted. Then fourthly, when it was Elijah's turn, he filled jars with water and poured them on his offering. Not once, not twice, but three times. And so by human standards, it seemed as if the odds were stacked firmly in favor of Baal. With this in mind, I imagine the prophets walking up with their chest pumped out, thinking, we've got this in the bag. Oh, Baal, answer us. Silence. Therefore, they continue calling out for, to Baal from morning until noon, yet silence. Silence. And so they ramp up their efforts by limping around the altar, basically performing a kind of rain dance in the hope that this would encourage Baal to respond, yet there's silence. 
And so in his boldness, Elijah starts mocking them. You can imagine it. Cry aloud, for he is a God. <laughs> Either he is musing, or he's relieving himself, or he's on a journey. Perhaps he's sleeping. You need to wake him up. Shout louder. Maybe he'll hear you then. <laughs> well, they're clearly aggravated by Elijah's words because we're told that they cry even louder. They start cutting themselves with swords. Yet look at what verse 29 tells us. It speaks for itself. There was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Well, now it was Elijah's turn. So he steps up. He asks the people to come near while he takes a series of steps to remind God's people of how far they've turned from him. Did you notice that? Firstly, he repairs the altar of the Lord, the place of worship, which was obviously in ruins because they had abandoned the worship of God to an extent. Secondly, he takes 12 stones to repair the altar, stones that illustrated the 12 tribes of Israel, therefore condemning what? Condemning their division. Remember, they were divided, 10 in the north, 2 in the south. You're not supposed to be divided, you're one. Thirdly, he builds an altar in the covenant name of the Lord, Yahweh. It'll be all capitals in your Bible, L-O-R-D, all capitals. This is the God that revealed himself to you. Fourthly, he calls out to the name of the Lord at the time of the offering of the oblation, the exact time when God would be worshipped by his people. And then fifthly, he recalls the promises of God towards Israel by saying, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Then he prays, verse 36, answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. And beautifully, we read in verse 38, that the fire of the Lord fell. The prophets of Baal were praying for hours. Elijah prayed for less than a minute, and the fire fell, consuming the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, licking up the water that was in the trench, the outcome was crystal clear. The contest had been won by Yahweh, for he alone is a burning and consuming fire. The one who had proven himself to be the only true and living God. But let's remember, this contest wasn't merely an opportunity to prove that Baal was a false god. Rather, there was a bigger purpose in this. Elijah was seeking to turn the hearts of God's people back to him, the Lord. And that's exactly what we see happening. For the people fall on their faces in repentance. They declare their allegiance to Yahweh. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But this declaration of allegiance wasn't enough. Faith always leads to action. So Elijah calls the people to seize the prophets of Baal and to put them to death, to rid themselves of all forms of idolatry in their life. It's a compelling account, isn't it? But what are we to take away from it? What lessons can we apply into our lives today? Well, the key point of application is this. Yahweh is the true and living God. And so whether it's Baal or any other claims to deity that people may worship, no one compares to God. Now that obviously speaks to you this morning if you're not a Christian. For if you're not following the God of the Bible, then you are following and worshiping a false God, an idol you're looking for meaning and purpose in something or someone other than God. You may not think about it like that, but that is how Scripture presents it. I mean, the Apostle Paul shows us in Romans that instead of worshiping the creator of all things, we worship created things. 
And this is always a dead end because created things cannot bring us the meaning and purpose that we long for in life. Rather, they only leave us empty inside. But even worse than this, God's wrath will ultimately be revealed against us for worshiping idols instead of him. However, that needn't be your outcome. You see, later on in Romans, Paul will make the unavoidable and inevitable declaration that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you know what he says straight after that? He says that we can now be justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. What this shows us is that there's an answer to sin. There's a way back to God, and that is through faith in Jesus. But this truth also applies to us if we are already believers today. You see, it's very easy. It's very easy to claim allegiance to God alone, yet to live as if we want the best of both worlds. What I mean by that is we live for idols and then we try to pin God on to the fringes of our lives. But let me remind you of the words of Jesus who said, no one, sorry, I don't have it up on the screen, sorry. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now in context, Jesus was speaking about the love of money. But the same can be applied to anything that becomes ultimate in our lives. At the end of the day, that's what idolatry is. It's when we value something or someone as being more important than God. Not only does it absorb our hearts more than God does, but we feel that life would hardly be worth living if we were to lose it. And let's remember that idols are not necessarily gods made with wood, stone, or metal. Idols can be those good gifts in life that we elevate to a position that is not rightfully theirs. Things like career, family, friends, popularity, success, health, wealth, possessions, and so on. When these things become ultimate in our lives and captivate our hearts more than God does, we have idols. And so search your heart this morning and ask, are there idols that lie there? Because if there are, you need to respond. And this passage shows us that the only acceptable response is to repent. Repent and to reaffirm your allegiance to God and to put your idols to death. Now that could mean stripping certain things out of your life being radical in your response if idols are hindering your relationship with God. But of course, let's remember no sacrifice is too much if it means being able to draw near to God. However, for most of us, I imagine, it'll mean putting things back in their rightful place, not above God, but under God. For this passage in 1 Kings not only reminds us that God has no rivals, but it also shows us that nothing compares to him. You see, nothing but God can satisfy the deepest longings of our souls. Likewise, nothing but God can help us in the face of death. Therefore, worshiping idols is not only empty, but it also brings us nothing but disappointment. With this in mind, God alone is worthy of our full allegiance. We should love him with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds, all our strength. God versus Baal. Put, any, put anything else there. God versus whatever else you might want to put there. There's only ever one winner. God. He is the only true and living God. Come, let us adore him. Let me pray. Father, 
as we've been confronted with the majesty of God, the one who sent fire from heaven. Lord, we plead and pray that God, the same God who sent physical fire that day, would send spiritual fire this morning into our hearts, the fire of revival, so that we would no longer be wavering between two opinions, wanting a little bit of God and a little bit of the world, but that we would solely and, and wholeheartedly show our allegiance to you alone, putting everything under your sovereignty and your headship. Oh Lord, rain down the fire of revival, we pray, that our hearts might be captivated by you alone, that our lives might be lived for you alone, and so that we might know the blessing and the wonder and the glory and the beauty of living for the Lord God Almighty. Lord, speak to our hearts. Help us to repent of any idols that lie there, to renew our allegiance to you, and if anyone doesn't know you, Lord, whatever they're worshiping, show them how empty it is compared to you and help them to bow the knee to you in saving faith through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing before we uh, meet around the table. Behold our God, seated on the throne, come, let us adore him.
people cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And we cry the same this morning. You alone are God. Nothing compares to you. You have no rivals. You have no equals. So we come and we bring you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.